In our baby nest, we have very, very high quality um, uh, early education and care. We never call it childcare because, because of the connotations that it's just about care, it's not about education. It needs to be education with great care because you, know, you need to have that loving, containing, holding staff who are very aware about attachment and attachment needs. I mean, our staff have time to home visit every baby in the home, learn the rocking patterns of the baby, learn about how the baby is comforted, learn about all that stuff. Unless you can do that, we shouldn't be having these very little ones in our settings. If we can do that, then it's fine. We can do very good stuff um, with children from one in, in, in institutional care. So we set it up, high quality, teachers, educators, staff, all on learning journeys. Any member of staff tells, tells to me they've got what the qualifications they need for this job, they haven't. The social workers had to learn about child development. The uh, teachers had to learn about family support. The health visitors had to learn about informal group dynamics, group relations. Um, everybody had something to learn. Um, the paediatricians needed to learn about not talking in, in a particular kind of way and working where people were and, make it, and, 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 and helping parents to understand um, the decisions they were making. Everybody had to shift and change their professional practice. Um, and you don't appoint people unless they're prepared to do that. We changed all the job descriptions, so nobody was called a teacher, nobody was called a social worker, nobody was called a nursery nurse. We muddled it all up. And people used to hunt the building trying to find the teacher, and they'd pick the most bossy member of staff, and it usually wasn't. It usually wasn't that person. Um, and, and, and in a way, breaking down some of the barriers, nobody had desk space. We didn't have staff rooms for the first 17 years. Staff are entitled to staff space. Um, and, and we made that decision. But in the first years, it was quite good that nobody, you had to hot desk. So you were always talking to the other professionals. You didn't have a little boxy office in a room. The worst thing in England is that with all the money we've been given under Shore Star, we've spent it very badly. And people have been allowed to get away with co-location, not integration. Training support for early years practitioners. We designed and devised and developed all our own training courses. Nobody from HE here, nobody from higher education or further education. And one of the meetings was a lovely university board person, and I was so glad she was there. She was thinking about informal adult learning. If you sit in our family room for 37 hours a week, you could probably pick up two A-levels in our centre. Because everything that moves can be accredited in England. So we have a national open college network, which is basic, the most basic level of qualifications. Um, national vocational qualifications, which is the next kind of level of qualifications. And we've written our own foundation degree, first degree for staff, which they can all do at the centre. We've got our own master's degree for senior staff who want to do it. We've got a parent who's come all the way through and got her master's. We've got, who's now employed by us. Out of the hunt, we had six staff for many years. The first two years, we built it up to 17, to 23. Most children's centres in England would be about 10, 15 staff minimum. This, and then lots and lots of professionals coming in and engaging with them in different ways. Um, but, but, um, but we commission work from health, we commission work from speech and language therapy, we commission work from different people. people you know, other people are lent to us on different kinds of contracts. Um, but of the 140 staff we've got now, 28 years on, 46% were parents who came through that learning, training and development route. Research and development, every member of staff, a practitioner researcher. First piece practitioner researcher, I was remembering it, it's a lovely health visitor. She was allowed to come and be, first of all, we used to have a health visitor who didn't really want the baby clinic to be in the Children and Family Centre. This was 1983. All Children and Family Centres now have baby clinics in them. But she was, um, the families used to call her a hunting, shooting, fishing health visitor because we're surrounded by posh manor houses and estates. And, and, and they kind of felt that she'd come from one of those. And she was a lovely woman, Anne. And, and, and uh, we introduced well woman clinics. And actually she did us. I had to be the first person to have a cervical smear in our centre because nobody else knew what, knew what it was about and was willing to use it. And, and Anne was quite good at that. She was, it was her personal passion, survival cancer. Um, and and uh, I remember having it and the parents stuffed a, a, a great big stuffed dummy through the window. And I was laughing when I was having a cervical smear. So not the thing to do. But you had, you had to, so we had well woman clinics. We had condoms in, the, in all the toys. We had lots of lovely stuff, and, and, the well, and the baby clinic, Anne couldn't cope with running, but she was very good in the well-working. So and when Jill took it over, 
it revolutionized it. She brought in digital scales. She never weighed the babies. The parents weighed the babies themselves. She talked and engaged and listened to the families and worked in a completely different way. And the clinical nurse manager allowed her to have the caseload of the family center. And at that time, it was 300. Now we have 1,400 families. And so it, wouldn't be, it would be more than one health visitor's caseload. So a parent comes in with you know, a lot of our babies are prop fed and sweet bottled milk. Um, so they come in really with fangs by the time they're about 18 months. And the parents dare to take the children. They're the best dental clinic. And I really like the guy who runs it. It used to be, interesting, it, it, our building in the war was the health clinic. So people remember coming in for their war rations and their, and their baby stuff. So, and and, and the, the dentist who's there used to be there. And I, I, I brought him back in to see what it was. It was it's the drop-in now, the community drop-in. Um, and I said, you need to run your dental clinic a bit more like our community drop-in. And then our parents will start coming. So what he did was he came and he started running sessions in the centre about, about health and, and uh, dentistry and dental care. Um, and, and people started using his clinic much more. Because actually he's the best. It's amazing. But you've obviously got a lot of services around here. This is where all the shops are, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. So people are having to go here. But if you've got, got much money and you haven't got any transport, you're much less likely to come down here. Mm -hmm. My view was that, 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 of course, civic pride means that you're going to want a great and glorious building. But it's going to be very important that the, 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 the people who have got least feel that their needs and their voice is being heard. It's really important. I know in our building we had no money and we, well, there were no rules in 83. So we had all the, uh, we had to go to furniture turnaround, which was the reject furniture, because the local authority had only given us um, children's chairs and things to sit on and horrid adult chairs like you're sitting on really. Um, although those are these more comfortable the ones we had, which were plain plastic. But we wanted easy chairs and comfort chairs and chairs that an adult bum could sit on comfortably. And so we wanted, so we had old sofas and all of that. And, and now we wouldn't be allowed because of fire risk and those ones are incredibly inflammable and dangerous and all that. But so, so I think we lose something as we become more regulated sometimes. So, so we have drapes on them, which, you know, we, we have them very, we try and create a very homey, warm environment. So it isn't necessarily an edifice that people want, although architects love to design edifices. Um, so a second home. So if it's too posh, they're going to feel like they can't come in. 